Well, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, discuss this paper. Uh, everyone that knows uh, Fernando uh, knows that his uh, papers are full of insights uh, at different levels. Uh, this is no exception. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that the views uh, of this uh, presentation are my own and by no means represent any, any, any element of the, of the Fed. I'm sorry, I should have said that before. Uh, so, so I was saying that Fernando is, uh, is, uh, is such a creative uh, 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 theorist that uh, this particular paper is, is one example. It's, it's full of insights. Uh, at, uh, at, at many levels, and at the same time, it gives you uh, uh, also an, 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 an idea of how, how interested he is in using his models for thinking about really hard problems uh, uh, for, for his country, for Argentina, and, and thinking hard about some of the uh, key policy uh, elements that are right now uh, taking place in his country. So by, by, by many different dimensions, this is a is a is a is an excellent example of these sort of uh, of, of papers that that you should applaud coming from a person like like Fernando. So, uh, in my presentation, um, I'll try to cover a little bit more uh, of uh, because I'm not sure exactly what they have a lot of material in in the presentation. So I don't know whether they're going to write a theoretical paper or they're going to write an empirical paper or it's going to be a combination of both. So uh, I, my, my discussion is going to be a little bit more on on the empirical side on how can you think about these models for practical issues and how you think about uh, what happened in other countries and what happened in the United States uh, around, you know, the financial crisis, which I think is a big shock too, to put these uh, models into a test. Uh, but I have some questions about, uh, you know, some of the theoretical elements in, the, in his presentation. So uh, now the key is so how do you move forward and back? Because I, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, so w one of the fantastic aspects, aspects of, this, of this paper is that they present a new data set. He didn't have much time to cover it, but there is a new data set for Argentina. And that's a big thing. And it covers uh, uh, from 2012 to 2018. Um, but this is something that is in line with what has been happening over the past decade. So we see that there's been a big effort in trying to understand individual price dynamics uh, uh, by using a lot of large data sets coming from uh, price indices or scanner data, internet data, or very large surveys uh, by, uh, by institutional uh, done to, uh, to firms. So this uh, particular paper is a new contribution using this new data set that my understanding is covering around 300 items or products uh, for uh, uh, around 100 outlets uh, uh, for the metropolitan area around Buenos Aires. So it's, it's a very nice rhythm for a Spanish speaker to see that we call it Cava, so, so it's called Cava. And, and there's another interesting aspect to the paper that is there is a lack of reliability of statistics at the national level uh, for these countries, especially my understanding of talking to Fernando is that you, you might only think about something relatively standard and unreliable starting in 2016. So there's an addition here in terms of the effort of putting together this, this information for Buenos Aires to what extent that represents the whole country is something that's gonna come back, but is 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 very important. Uh, so the, 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 I think that what, try, what the paper tried to do is to using this new micro data set to offer testing different pricing mechanisms and these alternative pricing mechanisms are gonna have different macroeconomic implications. And sometimes it's very important to think about the pricing mechanisms at the, at the, at the theoretical level and the micro level to see that the implication at the macro level might not be the same, so they might diverge. So that's that. So, for these large class of state-dependent pricing models, so what the two, uh, uh, Fernando and Andy, try to do is try to discuss a set of testable implications in, for, for individual price adjustment and, and for the aggregate of the economy. There's a little lack of connection right now to the aggregate economy. I think they're working on it. That's one of my, uh, of my, uh, of my comments. So what, what's really the connection? And they try to underscore that is you got to pay attention to identifying key elements in the micro price behavior to understand really 
macroeconomic flexibility. I'm going to come back to that in my, in my uh, discussion. And, and one of the beauty of the, of the exercise is that they use an, obviously a narrative approach because it's very easy to identify large aggregate cost shocks uh, for Argentina during that period uh, and in an inflationary economy. And that's put the model to a test, this particular set of, of models, state-dependent pricing model. So Argentina is a great candidate for thinking about how these models can be tested. So I'm going to have two set of comments. Uh, one is I'm going to assume that the paper is going to be an empirical paper with, with theory. So I'm, 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 there are a bunch of uh, contributions already in the, in the literature by, by Fernando. So, so um, I'm going to have uh, three comments. So the, the first comment would be, well, I, I would like to see much more description of the richness of the micro data that they have especially when you think about how do you define price changes here. There are many dimensions, many margins that the outlet can use to change prices, and you can define prices in many different ways, you know, just spot prices, but you can reference prices, and, and, and I'll be clear about that. So I think that they, they should look deeper into the sectoral distribution of the frequency of price changes. So right now the model is pretty stylized, and we have some discussion yesterday about how important it is to look at the uh, the sectors on this morning too. And um, you know, I'm not gonna go deep into this, but it'll be interesting to see whether these capture or not uh, the aggregate price dynamics of Argentina. So this is a good way of representing what's going on there. And then the second set of comments will be, okay, what are they thinking about the microeconomic implications? So what I think is these large class of state dependent models may seem to fail and I have some ideas on how can you think about that? In, in some of the observations that they're using, especially have related with some dimension of the margin that they're not seeing in the data right now. And it can be, Fernando has some models that try, that try to you know, actually address some of the issues. So, and finally, I think what the, the, the paper, or the, the, the analysis right now lack is, I think the models are really rich and this could be my comparison with, with Chile, so which, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, what are the aggregate implications of this model? The size of the shock matters, uh, there are potentially non-linear effects uh, at the aggregate level, uh, does the level of inflation matter? And we see all that uh, in the data. And, and you know, I, I'm gonna show some examples uh, using the US economy and, and, and Mexico to see how, how these models can be useful for thinking about uh, uh, certain macro situations. And, one, one thing that Fernando didn't have much time or didn't emphasize much, I think it's beautiful, it's so elegant that he's able to work with this well microfounded model and try to produce an elegant, simple index of how do you go from the micro model to the uh, uh, a definition of the microeconomic flexibility uh, and how that depends on the size of the shock. And actually, one important insight here is that I mean, relative to what we saw during the conference is what he's actually emphasizing in thinking about these models and the macroeconomic implication or the aggregate implication has to do with something that we disregard in previous uh, presentation, which is actually the, how fat the tails are of the distribution. The kurtosis of the analysis is what really he's using to think about the aggregate implication. And some, some, sometimes in, in previous discussion, we're getting rid of the, of the tails of the distribution. So I'm gonna emphasize that that's an important insight of all these state-dependent models that uh, uh, for testing is something that you need to take into account. And finally, I think it's, uh, I'm not going to spend much time, we, we talk about this, so they need to somehow make an effort of finding reliable aggregate data, because it will be interesting to see around this episode what happened with, with labor, with aggregate labor, with unemployment, with, with output in this economy, those are cost shocks, we, we, we clearly have some priors uh, where they should look like supply shocks, so it will be interesting what happened, uh, not just with prices, but also with, with output. So there's a lot of things that Fernando can do in the future in thinking hard about you know, the general equilibrium effects of these of these subtle models. So I'm gonna get to it. Uh, I'm probably not gonna have much time to talk about my second set of comments that has to do with thinking about the th theoretical element of the paper. So I'm gonna I'm gonna probably skip all that. I'm gonna go to uh, uh, focus on my comments on from the empirical side. So if I have time, maybe I can come back to that. So uh, mm, so here, uh, 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 coming to the first point, so, uh, mm, 
I'm going to use the Great Recession. So I'm thinking about a large shocks that happened to the U.S. economy and thinking about how, what kind of evidence we have about re-optimizing prices. And so, so there are many different ways of thinking about how retailers are paying attention to what was going on at the aggregate level, and they're going to have even larger shocks. And, and coming back to what Mark was discussing, so it's not just changing prices. So they can use item substitution. They can use sales promotions. They can use novelty and comeback prices. All these elements are part of the strategy that retailers are using when you need to think about changing prices. So you need to redefine what a regular price is and how to use the frequency of changing prices. What kind of price are we thinking about? The posted prices, adjusted prices with all these dimensions or not? So I'm going to show you some statistic about these. This is for, this is joint work with uh, Etienne Gagnon at the Fed. So we're work, working on that. And this gives you for, for the U.S. economy what happened with the fraction of sales, with clearance sales, with comeback prices, some, uh, uh, I think it's, I think there's a, there should be a, there should be some it should be it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, but would you see that there is a lot of variation along these dimensions in the in, when you look at, at the U.S. economy and it's particularly you see that sales promotion tend to increase during recessions that uh, uh, clearance sales is, is less clear relative to other episodes and and you have some some element of comeback prices falling during the last uh, last recession so this is just to to emphasize that uh, those are elements that you need to think about when you compute uh, a statistic like the frequency of price changes, you need to take into account all these dimensions to uh, construct that. And they should probably, I don't know if they have that information in, in, in their data set or not, but it's, there's a lot of richness in the micro data that, that when you think about testing a state-dependent versus time-dependent model, you need to carefully look at it. Uh, so this is just for, for those of you that are less familiar with what happened in the United States over the last uh, 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 years, this is a, a very insightful graph by, by Bill Sklino and, and uh, 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 Pete Clinton being uh, Ben Malling. Uh, and this is show how the frequency of changes in, in, in regular prices has been evolved uh, in the US uh, since the, uh, 1982. So you see that the starting in the early 2000s, there's a, there's a, there's a, I mean, the data is telling you that there's a sustained increase in the frequency of price changes in the US. And what happened after the, the crisis in 2000, the last, the last point is that after the shock, there is an increase. But this part of the trend, so thinking hard about whether by looking around what happened in the shop with the frequency uh, matters uh, a lot uh, for, 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 for uh, uh, what Fernando was emphasizing in, in thinking how the frequency is telling me something about, about uh, 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 the difference between state and price uh, uh, and, and time dependent model. So there's a higher price flexibility here. Well, that's, that could be compounded with what happened during the Great Depression, with the Great uh, uh, Recession. So you see that, as I was emphasizing uh, 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 before, that yeah, there's, you see an increase around 2008 and 9 of the frequency of price changes, uh, uh, as you would expect from, from the large uh, shock that the economy suffered. But it's just part of an already existing trend. So um, there's no cyclical trending or pattern in, 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 in their data. So it will be interesting to, 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 to see how how they construct a uh, similar uh, statistic for, for their analysis. So, so uh, the second point is, is this, this, uh, this table, which is uh, looking at what happened about the sectoral heterogeneity that you see uh, in the US data. They could probably have information for, for Argentina too. And you see that there's a wide range of change in the frequently of price changes across sectors. This is coming back to your presentation. Um, so the services and, uh, and, 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 and clearly stand up as very low frequency of price changes as opposed to other sectors of unprocessed, um, unprocessed food and uh, energy that are you know, those in which the frequency of price change is pretty high. So when we think about models, what, what, so the, this dimension of the sector element is, is very important in thinking about the macroeconomic implication and even, even thinking about testable implication of these sort of models. So, and, and Fernando is well aware of that. So it will be interesting to, uh, to see whether they have this similar pattern uh, uh, around the shocks that they have for, for Argentina. So uh, this, is, uh, this is about uh, the microeconomic implication. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just try to skip that. But uh, so, so, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about that. So let's go to the aggregate implication. So that's the, 
so I think it would be interesting if Fernando and, and Andy spend some time because I think it's fascinating with this narrative approach. So this is just a, a way of describing the, 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 the size of sharks that they have. So those are, those are enormous sharks. I mean, there's a, there's a devaluation that has 60 and 80 percent in, in a few months. Uh, and you have, uh, those are probably huge sharks. And there's also relatively large sharks, which is a devaluation of 25 or 50 percent sharks. And when you look at regulated prices, you see increases in those uh, regulated prices by almost 80% or 50%. So, and you know, Fernando make a lot of effort in thinking about that the size matter for, for, the, for the implication of, of, uh, of the model. So this is coming back, this is my, my, my reference to Chile here. So I have, so Ricardo Caballero and Eduardo Engel spent a lot of time thinking about this model and, and come up with this idea of how do I use these uh, for thinking about the aggregate implication. I mean, they came up with this formula at the top that is, basically emphasizing two elements. So the initial pass through uh, of the shot that has to do with the intensity of the response of the firms uh, adjusting prices. And what Fernando emphasizes the second element that has to do with what, what is called the extensive margin. So the, the amount, the number of outlets that are really actually changing prices trigger or canceled by the shot. So Fernando, uh, relative to Ricardo and, 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 and Eduardo, have a, a, this, this, this nice, this nice, uh, To, to an approximation, I need one, one, one minute, sorry. Uh, so what I did here is that this is, I look at what happened in Mexico. So I think that this is kind of things that I was expecting from them to do. Uh, this is something that I did with Etienne. So this is, uh, we'll look at what happened in Mexico in 1994. That was a huge devaluation uh, in December. So this is, uh, the, the graph there show the distribution before the shock and after the shock. Uh, uh, of prices, so w the, the frequency of price change was 25% before the devaluation, and double, uh, it moved to 50%. That's kind of an interesting, and it's similar to what Fernando is emphasizing. I mean, given the size of the shot, uh, this is what you should expect. But what, I'm sur what I was a little bit surprised here is that, is that I don't see any, 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 any change in the, in the kurtosis, in the tail of the distribution. So, so it's just looking carefully about the, at the tail is, 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 a, is an important prediction of, of these subtle sort of models. And, uh, we did the same for uh, other, other shocks like the VAT, and I did something for the US too. So I look at the US. This is what happened in the US before and after uh, a shock that happens in, at the end of 2008, which is the cause of the Great Recession. So it was a big shock. It was a lot of shock. So output was falling more than 6% in, in a quarter. So, and you see what happened before and after. So here for the US, we don't see, when you look at micro data, anything in the distribution of price changes. For that large shocks, it's true that the inflation uh, on average is not very big. So, but I don't see any change in the kurtosis here or in the, in, the, in the tails of the distribution. So those are just examples or how, how rich is the micro data, how, how rich is the data that they have. And some example that, you know, at, at the first pass, I, I think that looking at the at the at the tails is not very informative to me uh, uh, for for uh, for what was uh, what was uh, thinking uh, that I was expecting for for the effects of the at the IA level. And I'm going to stop stop here. And again, it is being a, a a great great pleasure to to read and to try to understand all these all this literature. Thank you.